Hey everyone, it's Colt. Welcome to my terminal crash course. So this course, it's really a mini course, is intended for anyone who wants to become a web developer, software engineer, data scientist, game developer, pick your discipline, and you don't quite know how to use a terminal. You're not familiar with the different commands. Maybe you just want to use Git. Maybe you need to work with SQL, start up a server. There are many things that you can only do with a terminal. So this little mini course is here to give you the basic foundation that you need. Because this video is pretty long and covers a lot of content, I've included in the description of this video a little table of contents with timestamps so you can skip ahead or skip to the parts you're interested in. However, if you're a complete beginner, I definitely would start from the beginning. All right, so this video is sponsored by me, kind of. For those of you who don't know, I just launched an online job guaranteed software engineering bootcamp. It's for people who want to break into tech, break into engineering, get a job. If you do not get a job, you don't pay a cent, you get a full refund. There's flexible payment options. I'll go into it in more detail later on in this video. Um, I'd like to get started though. So that's a little ad pitch. Take a look at the link in the description if you're interested. Otherwise, buckle up, it's time for a terminal. So let's begin with a quick overview of what we're going to cover here. This is a pretty dense, long video, especially for my YouTube channel. So I wanna give you a, a kind of a table of contents, I guess. We're gonna start off by talking about why you need to know terminal and terminal commands if you wanna become some form of a developer, engineer, technical thing. Why does it matter? We'll also talk about a bunch of commands, including ls, pwd, cd, touch, make directory, rm, rmdir, man, man pages, clear. We'll talk about relative and absolute paths, uh, things like your home directory, your root directory, flags and options. There's a lot to talk about, and we're going to begin with that first bullet point, why you need to know any of this stuff. This is something um, I see a lot of students ask and confront early on in the process of getting comfortable with the terminal because it is kind of clunky, it takes time, uh, and it's just not that intuitive. These graphical user interfaces that we're used to, like Finder on a Mac, where we've got nice little icons, and I can scroll and drag and drop, double click, those were created to make the experience easier for the typical user, rather than having to deal with text to make your folders and files and to navigate with different commands, like we used to have to, we didn't have a GUI. The innovation was adding in a graphical interface so why go back to the, the original way of navigating and working with our machine? So there's really two pieces. The first piece that I don't think is as crucial is that you can be faster. You can be more efficient and just generally quicker using the terminal. If you're trying to make a bunch of folders and files or you're trying to delete things, if you know what you're doing, if you're comfortable with the commands, you can be much faster than doing it with your mouse and dragging and dropping and whatever, clicking. That takes some time to get used to, and that's not really the main motivation for, at least in my opinion, for why you should learn these commands. That's a side effect. The most important reason, the, the real reason to learn how to use your terminal is that there's a lot of things that you only can do from the terminal. So whether it's data science that you're interested in or web development or some other discipline, uh, a lot of the tools you'll use uh, require you to be somewhat familiar with the terminal, whether it's things like a database. Uh, if I have Postgres installed on this machine, which I installed using the terminal, first of all, and if I want to open up the Postgres shell, I need to do it from the terminal. So now I can check on my databases. Uh, whoops. I can delete tables and I can do all sorts of things. If you don't know SQL at all, it's not really relevant. If I want to use Git, if I want to, uh, let's go to something that has some Git going on. We'll see all these commands in just a bit. Okay, so I'm in a folder that I'm using Git inside of. I have a Git repository. I need to use the terminal in order to work with Git. A pretty standard requirement is to know Git and be comfortable with it if you want a data science or web developer job. Technically, there are graphical interfaces for Git, but I don't know many people at all who use them. Um, it's kind of a novelty. I don't know, maybe I shouldn't say that. I'm sure lots of people do use them. But in my experience, it's way easier. All the documentation, every tutorial you ever see, every course online for Git is going to be done in the command line. So just as a quick example, let's see what I've got going on here. All right, some Git commands. <laughs> That's all I'll show here. Uh, these are commands I need to use in my terminal. I can't do it over here in Finder. Another example would be starting up a server. So right here, I have a Flask application I've written in Python. Also not relevant if you don't know anything about Flask or Python or you don't care about web development. 
In order to start up a server, this is an application I've created, I need to start it, I need to use the terminal. That starts up my server. So there is no way to do that over here. There's no way to right click on a file and start up a server. Now my app is running, I can visit it in my browser. If I did not know that terminal command, I would be out of luck. Similarly, um, if you want to work with tools in Python or Node or Java or C or whatever language it is, you're going to need to use a terminal. To run your code, just to execute a Python file or a Node file using Node, uh, or to uh, download different tools like NumPy or Pandas or whatever you're trying to use in Python, you need to have familiarity with the terminal. So it might be an unfortunate reality for, for some of you. Uh, it definitely is a bit of a learning curve, but after a couple hours of practice, once you get familiar with the basic commands we'll see, it shouldn't really take much thought. Uh, it just becomes second nature to navigate and move around in your, in your folders and files and find things and make new things, run different commands. It becomes a lot more second nature. Just at the beginning, it feels very clunky. It feels like you've been transported 30 years to the past, but that won't last long. So stay strong. If you're brand new to this, it's worth it in the end. Let's start with the very basics. I want to get some confusing terminology out of the way. You'll hear things like terminal, shell, command line, console, uh, other things like bash and Z shell. Where does Unix and Linux and what is all this stuff? We're not going to go into all of that at this point. I'd like to just focus on two important terms to start. Terminal. All right, so in the past, a terminal was an actual physical interface to a computer. Uh, it was usually a keyboard with either an old school screen, you know, the black screen with green text, or other times it was almost like a typewriter where there was a, a printout of paper and you would type something in and then something else would be automatically printed back on a, a long sheet of paper. Regardless of the actual details, the terminal was just a text-based interface to your computer. It's how we could run commands and do things on the computer. Nowadays, we have laptops and you know nice computers with graphical interfaces. So when we say terminal, we're referring to a software terminal, an application that we open up that gives us a text-based interface to our machine. And then the second confusing term is shell. So a shell is the program or like the, the software running on your terminal. So we could have a terminal application, like on a Mac, there's a built-in terminal, and there are multiple shells that we can use. We could swap them out. Here's a kind of silly analogy. I don't know if this is helpful, but let's take something like an ATM, a machine. Uh, in our analogy, the ATM itself, the physical buttons, uh, the inputs, the slots, I guess, those are the terminal in our analogy. And the ATM itself has some software running on it. That would be the shell. So there are probably multiple ATM software, I don't know, operating systems or different, um, different programs that run on an ATM. There's probably not just one standardized, although I really don't know what I'm talking about with ATMs, but let's just assume that's how it works for the sake of the analogy. A shell is the software running on the ATM. Or think of a, a smart TV, if you've seen those. Uh, the TV itself would be the terminal. The software running on that TV would be a shell. So there are many different shells out there, uh, but there's really just a couple very popular ones. And the most popular is called Bash. It's so popular that on Macs, when you open up a terminal without doing anything, if you go and open up terminal right now, you will be using a Bash shell. So all the commands we'll be learning today are going to work in a Bash shell. That doesn't mean they only work in Bash, uh, but that is our primary target here. Now for the annoying bit, setup, installation, all of that stuff. It may not be annoying if you're on a Mac uh, because there's a built-in terminal application. It's just called Terminal. If you search for Terminal, open it up, you will have a Bash shell open in your terminal automatically. Yours will probably look different. It won't have the same colors, the same prompt. I do have a YouTube video on how to configure your prompt, but that is not something we need to concern ourselves with right now. So if you're on a Mac, it's pretty easy. If you're on a Windows machine, it used to be a whole lot worse than it is now in order to get a bash shell uh, up and running uh, it's so that you can use the same standardized commands that everyone else uses or the majority of people use in web development. Uh, the reason for this is that Windows has its own shell, something called PowerShell that it comes with. Now the commands that we use in PowerShell actually do differ 
There is some overlap, but there are significant differences between what you'll be learning here and what will work in PowerShell. In the past, uh, this was the bane of my existence when, I'm, when I was teaching in-person boot camps. Installing a virtual machine on a Windows machine uh, is just, uh, there's so many things that can go wrong. It can be very frustrating. But more recently, there is a much easier solution to get the same type of shell set up on a PC. What you need to do is enable the Windows subsystem. And I've linked to a tutorial on this. Uh, this tutorial talks about what it is. It's basically a way of running Linux or Unix on your machine, on a Windows machine, side by side, so that you can use the same commands. So follow the steps in this guide. Uh, there's just a couple of them. If you scroll down here, you need to enable something. It's basically a checkbox. Download something, and that's it. So it's not too bad. It used to be a whole lot worse. So go ahead and do that if you are on a Windows machine. If you're on a Mac, just open up the built-in terminal app, and we should be good to go. Alrighty, so hopefully by now you have a terminal window open. Now we just need to learn a bunch of commands to make it do stuff for us. You are probably used to working with a graphical user interface. On a Mac, we have Finder. Uh, on a PC, I can't remember what it's called. I want to say File Explorer. That might be complete BS, and I'm just pulling that out of nowhere. But whatever the, the correct term is on your operating system, there's usually a graphical interface where we can view folders and delete things by dragging them to the trash. I can rename something. I can move something around by dragging and dropping. Um, I can view the contents of a folder like this React course folder by double clicking. And I can continue to open things or I can use the back arrows to go backwards. I have an interface to the contents, the underlying directory structure of my computer. Using our terminal, we can do the exact same thing. We can navigate around our folders and files, plus a whole lot more. But before we can do any of that lot more stuff, we need to understand how to replicate what we already do using the graphical interface. So there's a couple of really basic things that we'll use all the time. The equivalence of double clicking on a folder or backing out using the left arrow, the back arrow. Even something as simple as figuring out what directory I'm currently inside of. With the graphical user interface, it just shows it to me here. Um, I can see the contents. It's a little bit trickier on our command line. But remember, it's all worth it in the end because there are many things we cannot do uh, using this interface here, but we can over here. So the very first command we need to see is one called list, ls. And on its own, just ls and you hit enter, that's it. It is going to list the contents of the current directory we are inside of in our terminal. Now, when you open up your terminal, unless you have changed some setting at some point, which most of you probably haven't, it's always going to open in the same spot. It's a special directory called your home directory, and we'll talk more about that in a moment, but let's just verify that it does list the contents of our folder. So I'm gonna type ls in my terminal, I just opened a brand new window, I haven't done anything else. I hit enter, and it lists a bunch of contents, folders and different files I have available in my current directory. Now this current directory, as I mentioned, is a special place called our home folder. Um, on a Mac, it will, my terminal at least, I didn't set this up myself, it displays a little home icon here. That indicates it's the home directory. Uh, the equivalent using Finder, if I back out one level, is right here. So this home directory is my main user account directory on this computer. I do have multiple users. I have my personal account, Colt Steel, and then recording user, which is where I do recording, like this video and my Udemy courses. I just don't want text messages and email notifications and all that stuff popping up. So I have this recording user that is relatively sparse, just has my courses. Anyway. Whatever user you have, whether you have multiple on your machine or just one, you will have some home directory that your terminal opens up in. And inside of it, we have things like my downloads folder. Now this is not always going to be the same depending on your operating system, but on a Mac, uh, I have things like my pictures and music and movies folders. I did not make those, those are put there. Um, what else do we have? A bunch of different course folders I've made, a React course folder. Uh, a songwriting folder, Springboard, uh, Terminal Demo, all these different folders that I have, they are showing up here when I type ls. Now usually we'll be navigating 
into nested folders and finding files and opening them and creating stuff from the command line. We're not going to stay in this one directory. Just like if I wanted to, I don't know, open up uh, this React course, I would double click and maybe I'm looking for a, a particular file or folder, something I made. Let's say it's inside of this folder here, inside of here. Okay, I found the file. I can double click it or I can rename it or do whatever. But I just did multiple operations, multiple commands using the mouse and this graphical user interface. And I'm no longer in my home directory. I'm inside of a directory called O3 slots exercise. Now, if I wanted to know the name of my directory that I'm inside of in my terminal right now, I can't just look at the top and see the name. Well, I guess this is a special case. I can see it right now because of that home icon, but usually I need to use another command called PWD. Now PWD stands for print working directory. Think of it as a where am I command. It will print to you the current path to your folder that you are inside of in your terminal. It's uh, kind of like when you're at a mall or a theme park and there's a, a map with a you are here sticker on it or a marker. It's kind of the same thing, maybe, I don't know, it's a bit of a stretch. So if I type PWD and hit enter, it shows me the path, the full path to get to the place I am right now. Remember the default when I open up a terminal is going to be my home directory for the current user I'm using, which is recording user. So you'll see something different, but this is my home directory. Before we go any further, one command you'll see me use a lot uh, that is really not essential is the clear command. I really hate when I'm recording and there's a bunch of text. If we hit clear, it just erases it, although it doesn't actually erase it. If I scroll up, it's all still here, but it hides it. So I use clear a lot, but you may or may not care about that. I just don't like it to be cluttered. Anyway, so PWD on its own with LS is not all that useful because we're stuck in one spot. I can look at the contents and I can print my current directory, the path to that directory, but I can't move. It would be like permanently looking at this folder and not being able to click or open or do anything. Well, in order to move between different folders, very important, we have another command called CD. It stands for change directory. So CD, followed by the name of a folder or directory, the official term, I guess, will move us into that directory. So let's first uh, do something with the graphical interface. Let's go to the, I guess the React course folder and open up the Pokemon project folder. And there's another folder called Pokemon. Okay, so what we want to do in the terminal is replicate this exact same thing. I want to be able to see these files and folders in the terminal. Well, to get there, I had to double click first on a folder called React Course. So over here in my terminal, I would change directory into React Course. And I want to make sure that is a directory in this current directory. And it is, I can see it right here, React Course. And I'm going to CD into React Course. And I can use tab to autocomplete. I don't have to type the whole thing. And then I'll hit enter. Okay. Now if I type ls, I'll see different contents. I have a bunch of numbered folders. 01 basics, 02 JSX, 03 props and more. Same thing I see over here. Also, if I type pwd, print working directory, it changes. It now says you are inside of your user's recording user directory, specifically the React course folder, which is what I have over here. So if I wanted to look at that Pokemon project, I'll type LS again and make sure it's here. It's 05 Pokemon project, CD into that. I'll just type 05 and hit tab. I'm gonna clear, it's getting too cluttered. If I type PWD, now my working directory path is everything that we had before with 05 Pokemon project tacked on at the end. I'll type ls. Now I see this one folder called Pokemon. I'll cd into that over here. Okay, type ls again. Now I see these files and folders. So eventually we'll see how we can delete things and create new fol folders and files and all of that. For now, we're just looking at it. We're just an observer. But we have a problem, which is I am stuck here with what we know right now. 
we don't know the back arrow of terminal. How would I go back a couple directories? Well, one option is to type an entire path. Like if I do PWD again, and I'm currently in this Pokemon folder, if I wanted to go back to the React course folder, I could copy this entire thing or type it myself and then CD into that if I paste that. And that does work if I type PWD. I have now gone back a couple levels, but that's pretty obnoxious to have to type the entire path name and do this whole copying of PWD. There's an easier way, which involves CD, but it's slightly different. There's a special name in our terminal, which is dot dots. It's a shortcut that we can use to access the immediate parent directory. So CD dot dot is just like the back button in this graphical user interface. I can go into some folder, hit the back button, and it takes me back to the enclosing folder. So if I'm in the React course folder right now, PWD, the enclosing folder is my home directory. If I do CD dot dot, it takes me back. If I type PWD, I'm now at slash users slash recording user. If I go forward, let's go back into React course and type ls. Let's go into this 14 forms exercise folder, which I have right here. And I'll clear, type ls. There's a couple different folders in here. If I want to go back one level, cd dot dot. Now, I'm viewing the parent folder. CD dot dot again takes me back to the home directory. So I am backing up one parent folder at a time. So now we can go backwards and forwards using CD. We can change directories. Next, we need to talk about the difference between an absolute path, which we haven't talked about, and relative paths, which we also haven't really talked about either. So there are different ways of referencing folders or file paths. Currently, when we've been CDing into uh, some directory, let's say, we'll take a look at this terminal YouTube directory. All I have to do is reference CD and then terminal YouTube or YT because I am in the folder that contains terminal YT. So I can get there very easily. I just need the name of the folder. And from here, if I wanted to switch to the, how about React course directory, which is one parent directory above and then into React course. So from where I am right now, I don't see React course. I cannot CD into React course. If I try, no such file or directory. It would be like trying to double click from inside this folder. There's nothing to click on called React course. So I could back out one level CD dot dot and then CD into React course. Another option would be this right here dot dot slash react course so go back one level and then react course and that works too but all of these that we've seen so far right here right here every cd we've done has been a relative path it is a path relative to where we are right now so this path right here dot dot slash react course is only going to work if i am in some folder that is inside of my home directory where I can back out one level and only one level and then back in, I guess not back in, open up or enter the React course folder. So it's relative, that path is relative to where I am at the moment. If I tried it right now, it still works because I'm in React course, if we do PWD, and I'm just saying go back one level and then back into React course. But if I were nested inside of some directory, like CD dad jokes, and I tried running that same command. By the way, you can use the up and down arrows to cycle through previous commands. If I try and cd dot dot react course, it's gonna tell me there's nothing called react course. If I go back one level, that takes me into the react course directory. cd dot dot, there's no way to cd into react course from here, I'm already in there. So this brings us to absolute paths. An absolute path is a reference, it's the full path name to any file, and it doesn't matter where you are on the machine or in your terminal, in the folder structure, you can use that absolute path to access any other resource. Now these absolute paths are typically long because they are the full pathway needed to access a folder. For example, when we type PWD, this gives us the full absolute path 
to React course. I could use this from anywhere. If I were to copy this, which we usually don't type these, I just want to show you the, the important distinction here. If I CD into something else, how about uh, CD into my, what do we have? How about uh, Git demo and CD into color changing text. All right. If I wanted to go to React course from here, I could simply CD and then paste that in. And it takes me right there. I'm now inside of React course. It doesn't matter where I run this from, it will take me there. So how does this work? Where does this absolute path actually begin? It's absolute to what? Well, at the very, very beginning, there is a slash. This slash is important. This slash references something called your root directory. We've seen the home directory, now we have the root directory. So if I back out, I'm now in the home directory, recording user, the name of my user account here. But what if we go one level further up? Now I'm in this users directory. It has a bunch of different users for this machine. Back out one more time. Notice the path is just slash. If I do PWD, it's just slash. Slash is the symbol we use to represent the root directory. And the root directory contains a lot of stuff that pertains to your system. Um, there's hidden files here. We'll see how to look at those in a moment. But usually we don't do a whole lot of work here uh, as in terms of like writing our code and creating applications and putting files here unless we're doing some configuration or installing something that requires or necessitates uh, being in the root directory. So in Finder, this is my home directory. This is the users directory with all the different users on my machine. And this is the root directory. So the root directory is always referenced by simply slash. So I could go anywhere on this computer. I could rerun this command to go back to, where are you? Go back to React course. And if I need to go to my root directory, I can just CD slash. And it takes me there. Now we also have a shortcut for the home directory. The home directory is far more commonly referenced and used. Um, it's just, it kind of makes sense. This is where all of my information and files and uh, pretty much everything I'm going to do is, is somewhere inside of some user's home directory. As you can see, all my course files are here. Every video I've recorded is here. It's all in this recording user home directory. So we have a fancy way of referencing the home directory. We don't have to do slash users slash recording user. Instead, we have this symbol right here, the tilde, usually located above the tab key. Uh, you have to hold shift on most keyboards. So shift, and then that, t uh, I think it's a backtick character. Shift backtick gives us the tilde. If I do cd tilde, it takes me to the home directory. If I do pwd, I'm home. You can see up there too, I'm home. So if I go back to this React course, and why don't I CD a couple other things or into a couple other things? CD into dad jokes app. All right, so now PWD shows that I'm very nested. To go back to recording user, I don't need to do CD dot dot, CD dot dot, CD dot dot. I can simply CD tilde. And it's a shortcut. I'm now back in my home directory. Okay, so absolute paths always start by referencing the root directory, simply a slash and then some other path to get to wherever you are. Uh, in this case, the absolute path to dad jokes app is root directory slash users slash recording user, so my home directory, slash react course slash dad jokes slash, slash dad jokes app. Now, most of the time, um, I don't really reference absolute paths all that often. Typically, my workflow at least is a kind of haphazard, honestly. Uh, if I'm trying to get to some folder inside of, let's say, I guess React course again, if I want to get back to that dad jokes, I usually do this CD React course. Then I get here, I take a look around with LS and I find what I'm looking for, dad jokes. And I kind of just repeat that. Um, but if you know exactly where you're trying to go, then you could use an absolute path. Just remember an absolute path works anywhere on your machine. It doesn't matter how nested you are or how high up you are in the folder structure. If you know the absolute path to a given folder or file, you can always use CD with that absolute path, but it begins with a slash from your root directory. Otherwise, what I'm doing here is simply a relative path. This is not going to work from anywhere on my machine. I need to make sure that dad jokes exists at this path relative to where I am right now. 
All right, so that's a lot about CD, but LS and CD are pretty much the bread and butter of just moving around and navigating. Let's see some other things that we want to do all the time, like making folders and files, deleting things, moving things around. So we're going to start with a very common command. It has a weird name, touch. Touch is what we use to make a new file or multiple files at once through the command line. So trying to make a new file with Finder is actually not very easy at all. I can't just make a new file in one of these folders, let's say uh, the React course. I can't right click, I can make a new folder, but I can't make a new file. If I wanted to make a new JavaScript file, I would probably open up VS Code or text edit or something and save a new file here and give it the extension .js. If I wanted to make a new JPEG file, an empty JPEG file, I would need to use uh, Photoshop or Preview or some app that would allow me to save with the .jpg extension. But I have to open the app first, I have to go file save, do all of that stuff, find the correct place here. In the terminal, we can use the touch command, so I'm going to just go somewhere, and we'll talk about why it's called touch in a moment. Uh, let's see, where should I make, I think I have this terminal YouTube folder. Okay, so if I want to make a new file here, at the moment, we have a directory and then one, two, three, four files. Let's make a file called purple.js. All I need to do is touch purple.js. And there we go. It made me a new file called purple.js. To make a file or multiple inside of the secret directory, I could cd into secret and then do touch whatever, or can back out. I'm back in this terminal YouTube directory, and I can run touch secret slash, and then a file name, like uh, what should we do here? I guess index.html. So if I type ls, we don't see anything different. This index.html was already here, maybe a poor choice for me, <laughs> bad, uh, bad file name to duplicate. But if we look inside of CD now, we also have an index.html. And to make multiple, I can just do touch and then separate the different files by spaces. So touch, um, what should we do here? We'll do an app.css, app.js, uh, how about navbar.html, and empty.pdf. I just made four different files, each of a different file type, in one go. So when we start up a new I don't know, you're making a simple web page, you want an HTML file, a CSS file, and a JavaScript file. In a single command, you can make those exactly where you want. You can name them whatever you want. You don't need to use your mouse. You don't need to do file save or any shortcuts, command S. You don't need to have an editor open. It makes those files for me. Now they're empty, completely empty, but they are real files with the correct extension, whatever I've specified. If I go over to Finder and I go to the corresponding folder, here we see purple.js, and here I see those three or four files I just created. They actually exist. They are here. We can see them using the graphical user interface and, of course, through the terminal. And that's kind of it for the touch command. Touch and then one or more file names separated by spaces will create those files. Now, as to why the command is called touch, we will get to that. But first, we need to talk about something called flags. And then that will enable us to come back and talk about touch We'll get there. Before we talk about flags, I want to circle back to the new online bootcamp I just launched. I want to tell you a little bit more about it. So here we go. This bootcamp is the online, actual online equivalent of an in-person bootcamp. Not just the curriculum and the projects and the assignments and all of that, but also the mentorship. You have a one-on-one -on -one mentor who is a senior engineer. You meet with them every single week. They work at companies like Facebook and Google and Airbnb. You schedule a time with them, whatever works for your calendar whether it's evenings, weekends, and you talk to them about questions you have. Uh, you get feedback on your code. You get code reviews on your projects, lots of assignments. You go through mock interviews and a whole bunch of interview prep, technical, and uh, what would you call that? Soft skills interview prep. We have live TA help all day long. You can get help uh, with a quick technical question. The course is entirely self-paced. Some people will complete it in seven months. Other people might take nine months, depending on how much time you can allocate in a given week. We cover Python, we cover JavaScript and Node. We talk about databases and React and Redux, computer science topics. And of course, the main draw is that you won't pay if you don't get a job. 
There's a money back guarantee, a job guarantee. If you don't get a job within six months, you get a refund. Take a look at the link in the description. You can apply, you can learn more about it, you can schedule a call to ask questions. And now let's go back to Terminal and Flags and pick up where we left off. So flags are little options that we can pass in when we actually use certain commands. So I'll just show you a quick example. Here is ls on its own. And then I can add a flag like dash L. That's not a one, that's just my font, it's an L. This is a one, they look slightly different. And it does behave differently. So flags start with a dash. Think of them as like little check boxes or toggles. There's a bunch of these different flags that we can add in. And this is just one dash L, which gives me more information. So I can see things about permissions, which we're not gonna deal with, the name of the file, uh, the last modified time, uh, I believe this is the, the owner, the creator, uh, also has to do with permissions. That is one example of a flag. There's another flag, which is dash A, which will show us all hidden files. Now, we don't really have any hidden files, but if you're familiar with git, and if you're not, don't worry about it, but if I run git init here, I'm just gonna clear, I now have a new folder in this directory called dot git. I can't see it with regular old ls but ls-a shows me hidden files, and they all start with a dot. So dot git is hidden, meaning I can't actually see it over here in terminal. I think there's some, or in finder rather, I think there's some option where you can show hidden files in finder, but over here in my terminal, I can see them if I use the dash a flag. And I can combine these, I can do dash a l. And this will give me more information like we saw with dash l but also it will do it for hidden files like .git. So you don't really need to worry about hidden files at this point. I'm just using this as a demonstration of flags. ls is one example of a command, and there are multiple flags that we can pass in or add when we use ls. And if you need to figure out what those flags are, we have a different command called man manual like this, and then you specify a command after this is asking for the manual on ls, so we're not actually running ls. And I'll make this larger here. This gives us a bunch of text about ls. The name is ls, it lists directory contents, has a description, and notice all of these possible flags. This is the syntax for basically telling you what flags are available. It looks like pretty much every letter, maybe not quite every letter, I don't see z, but a couple dozen, at least, different flags. So we saw dash a, include directory entries whose names begin with a dot. Dash f, uppercase f, will display a slash after each directory. So do I have any directories here? Let me back out one level. ls dash f adds a slash there so I can see secret is a directory. These are all files. Also, if I go back to the man page, which is what most people call these man pages, manuals, to get out of here, if I hit enter, I'm just gonna scroll. All you need to do is type Q and it closes. So let's take a look at one more flag. What else do we have here? Uh, you can sort the output. Um, print the files serial number. Files, file serial number. Okay, never really used that. Uh, we saw dash L for long format. and gives us more information. Here's one dash uppercase r, recursively list subdirectories encountered. So what that means is if we have nested directories, like here, m most of these directories have subdirectories inside, a simple ls, I'm in my home directory, is only going to show me the folders directly in my home directory, but ls dash uppercase r, honestly not very useful, but it's going through each one of those directories and finding all subdirectories. I'm going to stop this because there are thousands and thousands of files. You can use control D or control C rather, and it quits that. So I've never used dash uppercase R, but it is a thing. And as you can see, flags drastically, maybe not drastically, but they can substantially alter the behavior of a command. So we have man pages for things like PWD. Return working directory name. Not many flags. Let's see, dash L and dash P. Okay. But the whole reason I even went into flags in the first place was to try and explain what the heck touch does. Well, if we look at man touch, 
and I scroll down here, it doesn't say that it does anything around creating files. It says change file access and modification times. The touch utility sets the modification and access times of files. If any file does not exist, it is created. So we've been using it in this scenario. We've been touch blue.txt. We've run things like that. There is no blue.txt file, so it makes a new empty file. It's how we create files from the command line. However, the primary behavior, at least the way that these docs are written, the man pages are written, is that the touch command simply updates the modification time of a file. It's very bizarre, uh, and I pretty much never use it this way, except when I'm explaining why the heck it's called touch. But let me demonstrate this. So let's go into one of these folders here. Let's go back to uh, terminal, terminal YouTube. Okay, let's do an ls dash L for long and take a look at these access times. Actually, I can't remember if this is last modified or last accessed, but there's a time here. Let's find the oldest one, maybe just app.css it looks like. App.css was last modified or last changed at 7.03 or 1903, February 9th. Now, if I touch that file, touch app.css, it doesn't do anything in terms of creating a new file because we already have app.css. If we didn't, it would make that file for me. But because it does already exist, all that it does is it changes the modified time. App.css now has 13.03 on the next day, February 10th, as its access or modified time. So even though the name touch is still kind of an odd choice, if you think of it as touching the file, touching the modified time or the access time, simply to update it, I like to imagine just a finger poking that file and saying, all right, you're updated. It kind of makes sense. When you're thinking about making files, it's not the best command name. I wish there was just a create or make or something like that, but that doesn't exist. We use touch. Anyway, there's kind of a long, long circuitous route to get back to touch. We had to first talk about flags so that we could even see the modified time because regular ls doesn't show us that. ls-l does. Then we saw man pages. We looked at man touch. I feel like I'm going to get banned uh, from YouTube for using that phrase, man touch. Anyway, uh, it sets, as we saw, it sets the modification and access times of files kind of uncommon, at least in my experience, to use it that way. I'm sure the, the mere existence of the touch command indicates that somebody either used to or still commonly needs to update the modified time. I just pretty much never need that. I'd say 99.9% .9 of the time I'm using touch to create files. Okay, so that's touch. Make a file or multiple files. If the file name already exists, it touches the file and updates its access time. What about making folders? Well, we have a different command. This one is a bit longer. It's called make directory, make dir, M-K-D-I-R. So M-K-D-I-R followed by a name of a directory or multiple names separated by spaces will create a new empty folder using that name. And it creates it wherever you are in the terminal. Or if you specify a path, just like with touch, we, we were able to do touch secret slash hello.txt or something. Assuming there is a secret directory, it will make the file hello.txt in there relative to where I am right now. So I need to have access to secret and I do. So we can do the same thing with make directory. We'll make our first directory. Um, why don't we make a new one called, uh, I don't know, application or just app make dir mkdir app now we have a directory called app it's empty i can cd into it there's nothing in here i can make multiple subdirectories let's make uh, let's pretend we're making an application and i want a testing directory and i want a templates directory i need a space there and i also want a what else testing how about models if I type ls, we now have three empty directories. I could make a subdirectory inside of, I don't know, models by doing make dir models slash, and then what should I make in there? I don't know, how about car, cars? So there's nothing new inside of this directory. 
the app directory, but if I cd into models, we now have a cars directory. And that's really it for make deer. You make a directory, make multiple directories. Um, you can make them wherever you want. I could make a new directory in my home folder by doing this, tilde to reference home, slash, and then how about delete me. Now if I go home, cd tilde, we have a delete me folder. You can also see it over here in my finder, right there, delete me. So let's heed the advice of this file name or folder name rather. Let's see how we delete things. So to delete things, we have a couple different commands. There is a distinction between deleting a file and deleting a folder. Let's go into this terminal YouTube directory and let's remove purple.js and llamas.py. To do this, we'll start with the rm command. It stands for remove, as far as I can tell. And we'll follow it with the name of a file, and it will delete that file. Or if we have multiple files separated by spaces, it deletes all of those files. Now it's very, very, very important to note, it does not put them in your trash. If you're on a Mac, I think PCs have the same concept of a trash or recycling bin. It permanently deletes them. There is no undo. Now this is usually not an issue because you have to be pretty deliberate when you're running this command. You have to write the name of the file. It's not something that usually happens accidentally, but just be aware that it will fully permanently remove it, uh, which often is what you want anyway. If you're going to try and delete something, when I'm trying to free up space on my machine or I wanna get rid of something highly suspect or compromising, uh, just kidding, obviously, probably, I wanna delete it. I don't wanna put it in my trash. If it's uh, a course video that I'm unhappy with and I just wanna get rid of it, if I use RM, it's gone. If I drag it to the trash, I also have to empty the trash. It's just an extra step. So let's test it out. Let's remove purple, RM purple. You can see it is here right now. And I'll open this up with Finder. You can watch it. It's gone, completely gone. I can remove multiple things like llamas.py space app.js, both of them, and now they're both gone. So we just lost three things. First, we deleted purple on its own, then I deleted two files at once. Now, RM is not going to work to delete a directory, at least not just plain old RM. If I try RM app, it tells me, sorry, app is a directory. RM is only going to work with files. So we have a different command called RM deer. It's like make deer, but rm, dir, and that will remove a directory, but it only removes an empty directory. So app is not empty, but let's cd into it. I think templates is empty. Let's look at it. It is empty. So I cannot rm templates, but I can rm deer templates, and now it's gone. I can rm deer testing. It's gone, but models has something in it. I cannot rm deer models. It tells me directory not empty. So rm deer is only going to delete an empty directory. If there's a bunch of files in there, it's not going to delete all the files. It's not gonna delete anything. It's gonna yell at me like it just did. In order to delete a directory and any nested contents, we actually can use the rm command, but we have to modify it with flags. rm-rf. So if we open up man rm, the manual page, and we scroll down, look for dash r, that was one of the flags, you'll see that it's equivalent to uppercase r, but I don't wanna type an uppercase letter if I don't have to, so we use lowercase r most of the time. Attempt to remove the file hierarchy rooted in each file argument. So this means that if I'm trying to remove a folder and it has a hierarchy nested inside, it has other files and folders, it will attempt to remove them all. Now, there is this dash F command that I mentioned, and often I just throw this in there. Uh, it is a little dangerous if you're not careful. Attempt to remove the files without prompting for confirmation, regardless of the file's permissions. So if there's an error, um, or if there's some, some permissions issue where we might need to uh, verify that we want to remove something, the dash F is just gonna completely ignore that and just blow through it. So you may not want to use that. I was taught to use rm-rf like for years um, and I've just always used it. However, 
I kind of think that doesn't make sense. I think it's better to just go with RM-R, and then if you need to force your way through with that removal, then add the dash F. So I'm kind of questioning everything in my life at this point uh, leading up to this video. I don't know why I was taught just to always use dash F. So we have this models directory. It's not empty. If I want to remove models, we've already seen rmdir does not work. Directory not empty, but rm-r or uppercase R, their alias to the same thing, models, does work. It's gone. I could back out. I could remove, uh, there's stuff in the secret directory, ls secret. There we go. I could remove all of that at once, which is why you need to be careful with the rm-r command. Deleting a single file, I guess it could be disastrous if you did it accidentally and it was a crucial file. But deleting an entire folder and, and whatever is nested inside of it can be uh, a bad thing <laughs> if you're not careful. So definitely when you're typing rm-r, pay attention to what you're removing. Make sure it's something you do want to remove. Um, also, if you're using Git, which if you're not familiar with Git, don't worry, but I do have some videos on that. If you are using Git, uh, it's a good it's a good reason to use Git. If you delete something you don't mean to, you can always revert and go back, and Git will be able to restore that file and its contents, assuming that you've added and committed appropriately. But just to prove this, I will delete uh, this secret directory. Why don't we go into it and make a couple other things? Make dear hello. I'm going to touch instead of hello uh, one .html. So now we have files in here. We have a directory hello, which has files or a single file inside of it. Now if I rm-r secret, it's just gone. That's it. Goodbye. I'll miss you. All my secrets have been lost. And that's how we delete folders that are not empty. So definitely be careful. Um, there are a lot of articles online and other YouTube videos that talk about the rm command, specifically with dash r and whether you could accidentally remove your entire user account. Uh, could you delete your desktop? If you're at all curious about that, uh, check out some of those videos. They're not my videos. Um, I've never wanted to actually test that out myself and record it, uh, but we, you'll run into permissions issues and you'll need to type passwords and be a super user. And that's at least what I assume, I've never done it, but definitely be careful and make sure you are very deliberate in what you are deleting because once again, those files do not go to the trash. They are gone. Now there is a way to modify the way RM works where you can, not, not without having to write a little bit of uh, shell scripting without having to configure your terminal, it's not gonna work differently, but if you do follow some tutorials online, you can modify RM so that it does put files in the trash and you have this temporary sort of staging area for pre-deletion, and then you can empty the trash. All right, so at this point, we've seen the basics of navigating, CD, LS, PWD. We've also seen making files and folders, touch, and make directory, MKDIR, and removing files with RM, removing empty folders with RMDIR, and removing folders that have stuff in them with RM-R. By now, you should have a basic foundation for whatever you plan on doing, that requires a terminal. If you need to start up a server, if you're trying to be a web developer or follow a web development tutorial, let's say for Ruby on Rails or Express or Flask, you'll need to navigate to some directory where you have some code written and start a server using whatever the, the specific command is in that folder. So you need to be able to navigate to that folder. If you're a data scientist and you need to install uh, pandas in a, a given directory, you need to navigate to that directory and then run a command using pip to install whatever dependencies you have. So there's a pattern emerging here. We use the terminal, the commands we've already seen to move around, uh, change directories, maybe make some new folders and files, delete things, but then also on that foundation, we add on new commands that are specific to whatever discipline you're working in or you're trying to learn. So at this point, you have the basics. There are many, many other commands that I could have talked about, um, and I actually plan on releasing a, it's probably an annoying, annoyingly titled video, like 20 terminal commands every developer should know. And they will include everything you've already seen, but some others, including things like head, tail, cat, echo, grep, find, move, CP for copy. There are many others out there. 
definitely do some additional research if you're interested. Otherwise, just tune back in my channel. Stay subscribed if you are. If not, subscribe. I really appreciate it. This video has been a lot of work, and if you do subscribe, you'll find out about that 20 terminal commands video, which will be out shortly. I've actually already recorded it. I just have to edit that, which is a whole other issue. Anyway, thank you for watching if you made it to this point. Um, I know it's a lot of work. If you are remotely interested in the boot camp, the job guaranteed boot camp I've launched, check out the link in the description. Leave comments, like the video, subscribe, all that stuff. Thanks for watching and have a great day.